Good afternoon to you, my beautiful viewers and subscribers, and welcome back to another video. I trust that you are keeping yourself safe and you are following all the protocol in the midst of this pandemic. I hope you are keeping yourself healthy as always. Now, in today's video, I am going to be continuing with my foundation engineering series as I have been doing for the past two videos. And in today's video, I am going to be looking at two prominent soil types, two frequent soil types that are encountered when you're doing subsurface excavation. And those two soil types are sand and clay. Now, I'm going to show you a small demonstration of what a boring log looks like. I do not know if you can make this out, but a boring log looks something like this. And the boring log just records the amount of blow counts that it takes to pass through a particular soil layer. Now, the soil samples is taken at every two feet. So I'm just going to read out to you the different soil types as the, explore, as, as the exploration goes down into the ground at different, different levels. Now, for the first two feet, we have loose brown fine to medium sand mixed with clay. At the second level, from two to four feet, we have medium tan fine to medium sand mixed with silt. So as I've said to you before, sand and clay, they sometimes intertwine. So when you're doing your subsurface drilling or your subsurface investigation to come up with your different soil types, you might come up on sand that is mixed with clay and vice versa. You might come up on sand that is mixed with silt and you can come up on clay that is mixed with silt and you can even come up on soil that is rocky and still has some contents of soil of sand or clay so from four feet down we have loose gray to medium sand mixed with silt and 10 feet down we have very loose fine to medium sand mixed with silt from 10 feet to about 12 feet, we have very soft gray inorganic clay mixed with sand. So this boring log goes down to about, I think, 30 feet. No, yeah, 30 feet or 25 feet thereabouts. And the different soil layer is examined and samples are taken to the surface, transported to the lab to have the necessary test done so that the geotechnical engineer can quantify the bearing strength of that soil. But if you have been listening to me, you would recognize that as you go down the layers, it's just a mixture of sand and silt, or a mixture of clay and silt with a little bit of rocks. So I am going to now tell you the different characteristics as it is regarded to clay and sand, as it relates to clay and sand. So sand, it makes good foundation material. So you will want to anchor your foundation at a level that is good. So if you come up on sand, sand provides a good bearing strength, although it has a immediate settlement issue, but that is not a permanent situation. So secondly, we have sand is usually strong and drains water very quickly. You would want your soil to drain water very quickly so that you do not have shear failure problems and you do not have settlement problem. And sand, it may have an initial immediate settlement upon loading, but usually very small and settles very quickly without causing any damage to the structure. So it has an initial 
immediate settlement issue but it settles very quickly and very steadily and do not cause any damage to structure over the period or, or life of the structure sand it behaves poorly in foundation because it lacks cohesion and in foundation engineering the two materials sand and clay sand does not carry a cohesion factor sand carries a friction angle and i'm going to be looking at that further on into my upcoming videos so sand you would calculate for your sand your friction angle and for your clay you will calculate your cohesion but because sand does not have cohesion it behaves poorly in foundation even though it is strong for your building to it is strong for your footing to be placed to carry the weight or the load of your structure when sand is loose and saturated it becomes quick and quick mean liquefy and major loss of supporting strength is loss so when the sun becomes quick as as we know the term quick sun it loses its strength and as of such it is not good to build on quick sun unless you're going to go past that layer and go down to a bearing strata that can carry the weight of your structure so that takes care of sand i am now going to be looking at clay and clay is generally good in excavation but poor in foundation right because clay as you know it when you excavate clay if it is exposed to water it does not drain water very quickly and from it doesn't drain water very quickly you can encounter settlement problems now clay strength is usually lower than that of sand right clay retains water and are relatively impermeable and do not drain water freely as i've mentioned to you just earlier that clay when it is exposed to water it does not drain water very well it does not drain water freely and that can lead to settlement problems or even shear failure problems now settlement in clay continues beyond construction and significant settlement continues for years or even indefinitely so as i've said to you before with clay, clay has a settlement problem. So as long as you can deal with the settlement problem and you can prevent water from getting to your foundation when you have a clay soil, then your building will last. But as long as water is present, you're going to have continuous settlement problem which can cause damage to your property whether minor or significant but nonetheless it can cause damage to your property i'm going to be talking about bearing capacity and throughout my presentation my previous videos especially as it relates to this topic foundation engineering you might hear me refer to the term bearing capacity now the bearing capacity of soil there are two types of bearing capacity there are allowable bearing capacity which is which is signified by the symbol qa and there is ultimate bearing capacity which is used by the signal qu or signified by the symbol qu now allowable bearing capacity the allowable bearing capacity also known as net bearing capacity is a net pressure in excess of the overburden stress that will not cause this not cause shear failure or settlement so the allowable bearing capacity it prevents shear failure or excess 
settlement. And what that means is when we calculate the ultimate bearing capacity, we have to use a safety factor or a factor of safety of three. So let's say for argument's sake, when we calculate the ultimate bearing capacity, we get like a thousand pounds per square feet. We as engineers, even though the soil at that layer, the engineer is not going to allow a thousand pounds per square feet on that soil. He is going to use a factor of safety of three and divide that one thousand pounds per square feet by three and that works out to be about three hundred and thirty three there about pounds per square feet and that is the load or the weight of the building that is going to be allowed on that side because we do not want the soil to become overburdened or overstressed that will cause settlement problem and will, ca and will cause ultimate shear failure so that is what allowable bearing capacity is is the amount of stress that you are going to allow the soil at that level to carry now the allow the allowable bearing cap capacity the formula for the allowable bearing capacity is q net over the factor of safety and the factor of safety usually range between two and three when i get into the calculations you will have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. Now, as it relates to the ultimate bearing capacity, which is used by the term QU, the ultimate bearing capacity or gross bearing capacity for a shallow footing is given by the formula QU. And QU, as I mentioned to you before, stands for the ultimate bearing capacity. Which is which equal to C N C plus gamma times D F times N Q plus a half times gamma times B F times N Q. And this formula you could refer to it, uh, it is referred to as the Turgese formula. This French guy who come up with this formula. So the equa this equation. Q U equals C N C plus gamma times D F N Q plus a half gamma B F N Q. This equation is valid for both sandy and clayey soil. So let me give you what these these terms mean. Q U, as as I mentioned to you, is the ultimate bearing capacity. D F as it is in the formula, is the depth of footing. And BF, BF, represent the weight of footing. Gamma, as in gamma here, is the unit weight of soil. And C stands for, this C here, stands for cohesion. And, and NQ, NC, NQ, N gamma, is the bearing factor which is derived from the calculation of the friction angle of sand and the cohesion of clay. I'm going to be doing a small calculation to demonstrate to you how net bearing capacity works or allowable bearing capacity works. And that is why, viewers and subscribers, I have given you a theoretical view of this subject before I go into the calculations. Because without me giving you a theoretical perspective to the topic, you're not going to be able to understand the calculation. So I'm going to do this small calculation to demonstrate to you how the net bearing capacity or the allowable bearing capacity works. Now, let's say for example, um, this question, a spread footing is to be built for a new construction project. 
is the allowable bearing capacity of soil under the footing is not at least 17 kilopascals, there will be serious risk of shear failure. What is the net bearing capacity the soil must have for the building to be safe? Now, this question is saying to us that if the soil beneath the footing of the building is not at least 17 kilopascal, then the building is going to fail. You're going to have shear failure. And as I've said to you before, you do not want to encounter shear failure when you're dealing with your building. Because shear failure is what is known as total failure. You can get total collapse that can lead to massive damage to your house or to your building or even massive loss of life. As in the case that happens in that condo building in Florida a couple of months ago. So you must always try to avert shear failure and that is the responsibility of the geotechnical engineer to design the depth and the width of the footing or the depth and the width of the foundation so that you do not run into, do, into these problems when you're doing your construction. Now, if you notice that the allowable bearing capacity is 17 kilopascal, and we know that the, the allowable bearing capacity equals to the net bearing capacity divided by the factor of safety. Now, as I've said to you before, in foundation engineering, we, use, we usually use a factor of safety of three. We usually use a factor of safety of three. So based on this question, we want to ensure that the soil beneath the footing is not less than, seven, than 17 kilopascal. So we need to make Q nets, we want to find Q net, but we know that QA is Q net over the factor of safety. Where QA here is 17 kilopascal, right? So it is QA times the factor of safety, which equals to Q net. So QA, which is 17 kilopascal times 3 and that gives us 51 kilopascal. So the engineer should design this footing to carry 51 kilopascal by establishing a safety factor of 3. So that is it for this video. Next week, I'm going to be doing the calculations for the ultimate bearing capacity for your strip foundation or your pad foundation. Also, if time permit me, I am going to be doing some vertically effective stress of your soil. That is very important. So stay tuned for that video. And to all my frequent viewers and subscribers you know what to do already and for my prospective and new viewers and subscribers please ensure to watch the video until the end keep yourself safe and i will see you in the next video no respect